Right. So, um, we last time we last time we were talking about you just mentioned two things. The marriages. Right. The way in, the way in which part of the genre of comedy is represents the, the possibility of the future without dwelling on the past. Oh, what future without what? It represents the, the possibility of the future without dwelling on the past. Ah. Right. Okay. So, what, and what else did we? What else did we mention? Um, that the relationship, about how holidays are reduced of the everyday, and how right. coming back is a different perspective. Mm. So we okay. But you really are. You really are reminding me now. Great. So we we were really speaking about the form. Oh, or the genre of comedy, mm -hmm. and the way comedy is always moving to a positive resolution. Mm -hmm. um, however, one of the things that we noted about this Shakespearean comedy is that, unlike its predecessor, I told you there was this play by Thomas Lodge called Rosalind, mm -hmm. unlike its predecessor, it just puts stuff in that doesn't really belong in the genre. Meaning the genre is, is a very artificial one. It's, and pastoral, the holiday place, is always an extremely benevolent place. I mean, it's almost mythic. But the, the pastoral landscape has, it has certain mythic qualities. We saw it in the Johnson poem to Penshurst, the way the pastoral is invested with, with, with those qualities. So Shakespeare's play, unlike Lodge, integrates not death, because as soon as you have death, as we spoke about in a Shakespearean play, then boom, we're in a different genre. So he's spirits of suffering and hardship, right? Um, we, um, I mentioned last time, they talk about actually killing deer. Shall we go and kill us some venison? And then Shakespeare actually has us see them. Their, their haunches gored, I meaning we get to see the blood, right? Um, Shakespeare describes the poor sequestered stag, this venison that has, I guess, been just been killed. So that itself is very odd. That's not what you really see in pastoral. You don't expect that. Also, we get to meet a, you know that scene where, who are the people that um, are part of this landscape? Who do they meet there? We, I'm, we, we know Rosalind and Oh, Phoebe and like those So we'll meet Phoebe, uh, Silvius and, and Phoebe. Mm -hmm. Who else is native to the forest? The Fuse and uh, the, the senior Duke, Duke Senior. Yeah. Right. And, and oh, is Orlando considered? No, no, no. He got, no. He just got so we said Jacques. They also meet, as, in addition to Silvius and Phoebe, like these classic pastoral figures, at least that's what they're supposed to be, we meet this pastoral shepherd, Corin. Right. How does he like things in, in the forest of Arden? Lame and in order? He says, I am shepherd to another man and do not shear the fleece I graze. My master is of a churlish disposition. So that's not what you expect from somebody who lives in a comic world. And in Lodge's play, the earlier version, there is no such hardship. And Corin is this generically happy pastoral character. So we were asking last time, why does Shakespeare make the, the Forest of Arden this garden inaccessible? I mean, even, even at the beginning of the scene, we see Duke, who's the Duke we're talking about? Duke, uh, Duke Senior. We see Duke Senior, naturally the older and the younger having rebelled. Um, we see Duke Senior actually freezing in the forest which again is something that's really not native to a pastoral tradition. So Shakespeare is emphasizing these, or maybe I should just ask you, what's the effect of emphasizing, the, of not totally fulfilling the generic contract? Meaning Shakespeare in a way is saying, I'm giving you a pastoral. We know what pastorals are because we go to them all the time. We live in London. So how, how is, as, as viewers of this do we experience it? Right. So just like at the end of the play, we said the marriages come along and emphasize what you've just seen is artifice, right? It's a play. So here, there is just that slight intervention of reality. 
so you're, you're saying it has there's that slight intervention of reality which tells us that it's this is really only a play right hmm. right so remind me where we were guys yeah. Um, I think we finished with Act Two. No, 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 just now. Just now. What we were, what, what, oh, yeah. What we were uh, about. I was just rephrase your question because I was thinking about it and I'm, I'm going through it again. Or what was your comment? Um, she interjects enough reality ah. to remind us that it's not. So I, so I, I, and what is that experience? What is that? What is the effect of that on us as an audience? To remember that it's a little sober. I guess it's so. I mean, I guess for me, it's simultaneously sobering. Oh, it's only art. But I think even in that acknowledgement comes this idea I'm not delivering you the generic thing you thought you were going to get. So it may actually be closer to reality, or this art form may prove that the truest poetry is the most feigning. Yeah. I'm going against the idea of fantasy. If you go to this right. pastoral land that's beautiful and that you can be, right. it's almost like it says like if you're there and it's beautiful, then whatever happens to you is going to be great. Right. But that's not the reality. Life doesn't work. You right. could go and, there and it could and be awesome. And that's awful. one. And that's one of the things that we were saying last time about the shape of Shakespearean comedy. That that A B A that middle is not as you're saying going to Club Med or going to a fantasy realm. I think that's another way of answering your question is that actually it preserves the connection between the comic world and the and, and the real world. That I see that there's an underlying connection between the two things. Well, doesn't it also mean, mm -hmm. put an element of reality into the forest? It yeah. also means that what happens in the forest can change what happens right. in reality. It means that it's not. Good. So that's another world. emphasis that's really important to make that this B place we started to say is not Disney World. It is transformational. There's something about the forest that is transformational. Is it what is that thing that's transformational? Is it art? Is it magic? Is it love? Right? It's it's it maybe all of those things. Um, and there were contemporary uh, dramatists, contemporaries of Shakespeare, who really didn't like this kind of very. There's something really magical about. It. The Forest of Arden. It really is transformative in a kind of magical way, which is hard to describe. So Ben Johnson, who also did wrote plays, had a totally different version of character, much much flatter, and they would never undergo the kind of transformation that Shakespeare's characters undergo when they go into this Forest of Arden. So this place, for some reason, is transformative, and maybe the showing its its reality or its similarity to reality shows us the relationship between these two places. It's not completely fanciful. It's not just going into a fantasy world. I mean, the fool goes into Arden and he says, the more, the more I am in Arden, the more fool I am. Why does, why does he say that? The more I am in Arden, the more fool I am. He has more self-realization, probably. But why would he have self-realization? I mean, this is, th oh, sorry, this is Touchstone. But he's the fool. Why does he feel happy in Arden? Maybe it's his natural, sort of natural habit. I mean, in a way, the fool at court occupies the place of holiday. Right. Right? The outsider's view. So when he goes into the forest of Arden, this place of holiday, the more I am in Arden. He's more comfortable here. Well, he, it's, he's it's, not the odd one out. Well, he, well, he just, his sensibility is common to, is part of this place. Yeah. It's interesting, the touchstone is, he actually gets married at the end to Audrey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he stays, mm -hmm. So for which is odd, right? I mean, I guess it's better to be married to a country bumpkin than to be a fool in a court. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I, well, well, let's, let's actually well, come. Well, is his life in the court that much better? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of evaluating really, I'm, why, I'm, I'm trying to understand why Shakespeare has us map the play in those terms that touch, Everybody else goes back, right? They're different. They're different characters do different things. Nobody meaning? stays in Arden except for Touchstone. Is there a meaning behind his name? That would help us uh, sure. Well, you tell me. What is a Touchstone? <laughs> what is a Touchstone? It's, it's a it's a core element. All things revolve around the touch. It's a piece mm -hmm. of fine grained dark schist of jasper or or uh, jasper formerly used for testing alloys of gold by observing the color. Of the mark, which well, so it tests things, so 
We so often think of it. The standard or criteria by which something is judged or recognized. There you go. So there, that's a nice definition for touchstone, that the fool in some sense is able to say things that other people can't say. If somebody else says it, what happens to them? They get killed, let's say, right? If Touchstone, say, Touchstone says it, that, that's his job. They had, they had days in, in France where they would, it would be like reverse day, right? So the lower class would become the upper class, the priests would become the, the clergy. Everybody reversed their roles. It was actually referred to as holiday. The world turned upside down. And in a way, Touchstone represents, in the sensibility, what we see in Arden, that everything gets turned over. If holiday continues into every day, what do you have? Yeah. Revolution, right? I mean, so that was, there was part of this holiday ritual in European culture of this release. So Shakespeare names his plays, um, Twelfth Night, which is a holiday, um, Oh Midsummer Night's Dream, um, Midsummer, right? Midsummer is part, right? Is the has a has a certain kind of holiday connotation. Yes, Uvita. I was thinking about the like the fool, the how it's supposed to provide comic comic relief, but oftentimes the fool also gives us an insight into the Good. truth of the characters or the truth about Why? what's really Why? happening that also goes against the societal norms of what, in a way, what Shakespeare is trying to say against societal norms at the time. You know what I mean? Like he, the Joker says something funny, but right. to us as modern readers, Excellent. often right. reads as something very well, serious Well, you'll see, if you ever read King Lear, the fool really develops. Mm -hmm. And the fool is the only truth teller. And everybody else is part of this social lie. And he's licensed to be able to do these things. <laughs> because that's his job. Yeah. I think that the, the forest yeah. is a place that, how do you say this? It, it loosens social regulations and social standards. Uh -huh. so, well, well, and good. the fool yeah. is kind of represents the absurd in everyday life. And the forest is the place of the, where everyone can be absurd. And um, like any and strange person, <laughs> I think when Touchstone finds a place where he can be himself without being the odd one out, he mm. wants to stay there. Mm. Well, right. I mean, and, and as you were saying, so right. So that might be interesting. We'll have to explore that more, why it is actually the Touchstone stays. Um, but he still does have to adhere to the norms to a certain sense. He still has to get married, even if he wants, even though he wants well, to stay Well, you might say that, you absurd. could even say the Touchstone is a preservative against disorder. How would you say, why, why would you want to have a... a, a Oh, that didn't make sense. Why, why, why is this somehow Touchstone help actually preserve the order? Those things you can't say. Because he says the things you can't say neutralizes he's them. Channel it all into and, him. Right. So he's he's the everyday inside. He's he's well, no. I mean, he, but he's he's an, he's kind of an outsider, as you said. He's an outsider. Um, so he can play that role, and in, that's why he feels comfortable and ardent, because it's also a place, as we said, the political world of the court at the beginning of the play. Is uni it's unilateral, monovocal, one leader. We get rid of any difference. We have all these pairs and they get split off. It's interesting that Rosalind and Orlando wear the same clothing, right? They're both wearing brown inside of the forest and you kind of see the identity between, between them. Um, anyway, but before we get to the forest, we're in that singular world. And remember that Celia says to, Rosa, to, um, to Orlando, if you only knew yourself with your eyes, if you only saw yourself with your eyes or knew yourself with your mind, if you only had perspective. And that's what's totally lacking, and that's why we said, uh, as you like it, really is a political play as well. It's another way, it's extremely, and, and this production demonstrates that from the beginning, right? With that kind of, imp this, this passing on of power. And we can see just by the way the stage is set up that everything is gonna split into two. Yeah, Vitam. When, when was it? Do we know when this was written? Yeah, I mean, around the same time Hamlet was written. What, what, like 1601? Okay. I mean, I don't know. If, okay. if this does go on YouTube, there'll be a thousand people saying that I made a mistake on the date. I did that on my Milton one <laughs> about, about the publication of when, when Shakespeare died or when Shakespeare's work was published. I got it wrong. 
but I think it's around 1600, 1601, 1602. But saying it's at the same time of Hamlet is really more significant because just like we associate Hamlet with this developed self-consciousness, so we will associate Rosalind with that. And I said that, that Rosalind, however, is Hamlet's healthier relative. Hamlet enters the world of self-consciousness, of reflexiveness, of what we call meta, and he just falls apart, right? Rosalind, however, keeps it all together. Rosalind actually is able to demonstrate psychic complexity and maintain psychic health. That's why in a way she is the most, the, the greatest Shakespearean mm -hmm. character. When you say psychic, do you mean psychological? Psychological health. Okay. Right. So, so she has, so she will have the same kind of self-consciousness, or partakes of that same sensibility as Hamlet does. We'll talk more about that. Yeah. Um, I want to just say, uh, last class I, I noticed that Rosalind and Celia were the only ones wearing color right. in the court, and everyone was wearing black. So I just realized that not only are they wearing different colors, mm -hmm. they're wearing complementary colors. Mm -hmm. They're the different people, but they complement each other. Uh, and you know this? This court. is another thing you know about. You know about colors being complementary. Yeah, they're colors that that, that work together. And we should take exactly your and we should take your word for them. Um, oh, it's you're just saying your visual eye it says. Yeah, yeah, oh, I see. Yeah, oh, I see. <laughs> I thought it was some scientific thing. Color wheel. Color wheel. Wait, wait, wait! I, I don't disagree with you yet. I haven't done what I was just talking about. Yeah. Right, right. So interesting. So you have this similarity that they're both different from the rest but of the court, but they complement one another. And we said that Shakespeare makes that relationship just so interesting. Because on the one hand, Celia's like, oh, you know, it's Orlando. Remember that scene? It's like, who was putting up these sonnets in the forest? Mm -hmm. And it turns out to be it turns out to be Orlando and Celia's like joyous about this. And yet there is that sense, and we'll see some of it, that Celia that that really is the primary relationship in the play. Celia and Rosalind. So Celia is wearing white and Rosalind is wearing blue and white. It's almost though Celia is like the pure, more innocent. Uh, okay, we're getting we're getting, we're getting a little too Spencerian for me here. I don't know if she, it's not so allegorical. I think it's nice. I mean, it's it was it's, it's it's. I think it's as you're saying. Or it's really, um, it's a sophisticated sense of costume design. That's but what you're talking like, about. Whenever you see a Shakespeare play, you're what that's so much part of the experience of how you understand the play. I saw a, 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 a version of Henry V which seemed like an anti-war play. I mean, in many ways it is an anti-war play, but it really celebrates Henry V, meaning it was produced in such a way that it was created a very, very strong reading of the play in a certain direction. They have a movie of that. Yeah, well, the same, I saw it by the same director. Uh, no, I, did, I saw it by... The Netflix movie. Right, Kenneth Branagh is the director. Uh, what's that? Um, but the costumes are the part of the production, isn't it? No, so costumes, the costumes are certainly it's part of the production. Yeah, it's, not, it's not written like in original. No, no, it's not. Shakespeare, this character. Shakespeare does, you know, right. you, you, but to visually help tell the story. It's so definitely, but I'm just saying that it's yeah. always what we're seeing in a production is a representation. Uh, we we like you know the things about this representation that we're liking. Okay, so let's. Um, is there any questions? We've been having a free-flowing conversation. Is, uh, do we have any questions at this point? I, yes, Vito. Where is this written in comparison mm -hmm. to the broad, like to what we're Renaissance literature that we're looking at in classic? Ah, Protestant, okay. Wow, that's a very Elizabeth, that's a that's a very reasonable question, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we could kind of guess that now. I, I, I assumed you knew something you don't know. Um, don't know. Spencer and Sidney were. I think Sidney wrote The Defense in 1580. Spencer was writing The Fairy Queen through the 1590s, I think. Right? I mean, Toddle, we know, is 57. That's much, much earlier. Um, when it was written? Um, when did Queen Elizabeth come to write? Uh, uh, oh, it was yeah. roughly in the 16 zeros. Okay. That, as in, like, it was written. Good. But it has also the Renaissance elements, like oh, Shakespeare. I'm sorry. I'm right. Nature, We're, I'm right. I mean, yeah. right. Shakespeare so is not a separate, not a separate class because it's a separate period. That's a, another great reason. I'm so glad we're doing Shakespeare in this class. Shakespeare is a part of the Renaissance, right? And we have to see him as a, obviously, and I'm glad we're making this point now. You have to see him as a Renaissance figure. I mean, in a way, he is. He's the great Renaissance figure. Is the great figure of of, of literature. 
Um, but he is located in that time period. And as we said, we see a continuity between Luther and Dr. Faustus I have and the, Hamlet. I have the years here. Uh, what? I have the years. Okay, we, we, I just want the relative timeline, right? And Milton. That we see that Hamlet, and, and one of the reasons, again, as you like it, is so satisfying, especially for our purposes, Shakespeare creates a true Renaissance individual in, Ro in Rosalind, right? I mean, he does the same thing with Hamlet, but with Hamlet, he's like creating a whole sensibility and personality. I mean, Hamlet is, the, the, I mean, it's the better play, but what I always say is that Hamlet is Shakespeare's greatest play, but as you like it, is Shakespeare's most perfect play. It really, and you'll see, it's really true. It just, um, okay, so let's pick this up. I think this is Act Two, Scene Seven, Line One Thirty Seven. Oh, right. Um, we, we haven't, we also ended saying that we were going to mention, at least, this famous speech that everybody knows, uh, right? Everybody knows all the world's a stage. The um, there, there is, a, wait, can you recite it for us? I mean, I don't know if I know exactly. Uh, we're we're going to cue you in a second. We'll get to you in a second. Um, yeah, so, this quote. Um, we'll see that we, there are two conceptions of time also in As You Like It. There is that, Jacques represents that other sensibility, right? From hour to hour, we ripe and ripe. And from hour to hour, we rot and rot, and thereby hangs a tale, the sense of things getting worse. Jacques, he's like, like the hermit was in Marlowe's Faustus, is like, where did he come from? He's in the wrong genre. In a way, Jacques is also in the wrong genre. And I, I said to you, but Shakespeare's playing with that. He's putting this very strong counter figure, again, to emphasize not only the comic fantasy, but Jacques, the question I guess is, Jacques at the end, he leaves the play. He says, I am not for dancing measures. Everybody dances, he says, I'm not dancing. He, he, was actually back to he basically him. says, I'm going, now to, I'm going to now play in King Lear. I'm in the wrong, I'm in the wrong play, right? But is there, a, is there a place for the skepticism of Jacques in the worldview that is represented in the play? Or, in, or that's a dumb question. Or is there a place for, the, for Jacques in the sensibility that Rosalind represents? Not the real worldview of the play, but what Rosalind represents. We'll see that in this play, we, and I told you you can think about it as kind of a map, you have Jacques. What does Orlando call him? M Monsieur Orlando calls him <coughs> Monsieur Melancholy. Mm -hmm. So Jacques is this figure of melancholy. Now, what about Orlando? What is he? What's, what's the melancholy's relationship to love? How does a melancholic feel about love? He's skeptical. He can't be part of it, right? Um, how, does, how does Orlando feel about love? Is he, is he the ideal lover? All over the place, like, but yeah. It's Orlando. Would you heal like, Orlando or get a grip on yourself? What? He's over the top. Right. But he's genuinely he's in love. Like, yeah. No, he's in love. I don't know. That's so nice. In his own head, he's the perfect lover, but I don't think he's the perfect well, lover. I, so, well, wait, one second. So, in his, I mean, I don't think, I don't even think it's really appropriate to say in his own head. Orlando is not a self conscious figure, right? Mm -hmm. He's madly in love. How do we know he's madly in love? He says to Pauline, he also, he's like, well, I would die for Well, first of all, I was just thinking that he puts up the sonnets on the trees, uh, right? So and then he's also the president of the Bad Poet Society, <laughs> right? <laughs> With all of Shakespeare's romantic males, the best ones, they're bad poets. What is, why are, are bad poets bad lovers? Or even better yet, are, go, are, good, are good poets better lovers? All right, so Orlando is represented as a bad poet. Why would he be a bad lover or a bad person to be in love with? Because he only thinks with his heart instead of mm. most of his head. Mm. Or he doesn't fully, he's not he fully self-conscious and he's not fully self-aware, yeah, therefore he, he cannot he actually articulate well, what he's yeah. feeling You're right. in the best way with someone who is a good lover, so to say, or someone who is a good, who knows how to articulate that is a better, in a sense, a better lover. Right. I mean, but Orlando might be said, like many lovers, to be in love with the idea of love, uh, right? 
Yeah. Romeo and Juliet, Romeo starts out with somebody else. Yeah, like he's in love with her. Later. And it's like, oh, where's, where'd she go? Right? Oh, here's Juliet. Right? I'll say, I'll say, I'll say bad I'll poetry. Say I'll, I'll say bad poetry about her. Right? But he's um, like willing to have lessons also. Like, like no, no. So we will, so we will see characters actually develop. Right? Now, Jacques is not a character, however, who does develop. He represents this cynical timeline, this cynical worldview. And in a way, the two notions of time, comic time and tragic time, are in, are in competition with each other. And it's only at the end, when Rosalind comes along, I mean, we know it's going to end happily. Um, but at the end, that, that tragic time is completely defeated in marriage. But we still see Jacques here. And, and here's our question as we look at this speech. How does this relate to his overall perspective? May I make another point about bad poetry? You can make another point about bad poetry. Um, I think that because he writes bad poetry, the, the reason his poetry is bad is because he portrays a very simplistic mm -hmm. um, understanding of love. And by doing that, um, that's not maintainable because relationships take work and love is hard. That's and but he but shows it, that he you're, you're saying what you're saying really what I said. He's a narcissist. Do you, do you know, have you ever gone out with a boy who is a narcissist? <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not hard to find young men in that category, right? <laughs> and so, it, it, uh, so Romeo and, and, is a, and Jacques are a certain, ver, or, 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 uh, sorry, Romeo and Orlando are certain versions of that kind of narcissism. But Orlando's kind of cute, right? Right, that's, that's his redeeming. He's redeemed. There's something, again, my name is love at first sight, it's magical. There's something like, attractive about it, non-physicalness in the sense of his excitement and will to, to sure. go through Right, do you like the actor who plays him? I mean, he does, he conveys that. <laughs> Sometimes he's a little bit too it's giggly. A little bit annoying. Right, so he's a little bit too giggly. But I think, for, for me, it, he, I, Shakespeare, good Shakespeare productions are very hard to find, and this certainly qualifies as a good one. And all the main characters are, 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 are yeah. good to great, right? Which is more than you can ask Sue for. Sue is really good here. I love Sue, yeah. Uh -huh. She's okay. hilarious. So that would be an interesting, you know, Margaret Atwood wrote that book, The Penelope Ad, Penelope's Perspective on the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. really? Right, right about, we, we read from it. Write oh. Celia's Perspective on As You Like It. Write Celia's Journal. <laughs> What's Celia's journal entry in the last act? Well, she, oh, but she's happy also. She gets to get married, right? Right. So, uh, so she's... Doesn't mean she's happy. What, yeah. well, wait, who did, what, wait, who did she get married to at the end? Uh, didn't she well, Oliver, right? right? What? No, she doesn't. Yeah, yeah. Wait, what yeah. did they yeah. did they were they, were they going to the movies and going out for dinners during part of this what we didn't yeah. see? Where does Oliver come from? He was such a bad it's guy. Wait, wait, wait. So Oliver really, first of all, yeah. in this production, if you watch it, he comes in all bloody because the Duke actually beats him up. Right? And for some reason though, we find that Oliver magically, right? He he does chuva, right? He randomly right? repents, yeah. Yeah, he yeah. randomly repents. And Baruch Hashem, right, thank God. Um, yeah, Rosalind married. gets married, and Celia also gets married. <laughs> right? Is, 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 is Celia as happy as, as, as Rosalind? No, no. Doesn't oh. mention. That's what well, the, the ironic matter. part is that not all these marriages are, it's yeah. not really a happy ending for everyone. Well, so it's, well, right. So here Shakespeare again is kind of undermining the general yeah, convention. Yeah, like it. This is what you want, so I'm going to do it. Right. Yeah. right. So I'm going to keep on giving it to you. Audience. You want to get you want a, you want a wedding? Here's one. Here, everyone. I'll throw in he another one. Unmarried. Right? He's forced. I'm going to do it. Yeah. Uh, right. No, uh, right. No, but it's not. A, it's different. Right Shakespeare knows it's forced. He's he's doing that to us in audi as an audience. He's giving us what we like and even more than what we like. And so we have to realize. We have to realize what the real pleasures of as you like it are. Right, and there's that self-consciousness which we'll see reflected in Rosalind as well. Let's finally watch this scene. The question was, what does, how does this speech that Jacques give, how is it related to his sensibility? This wide and universal theater presents more woeful tragedies than the scene before. Oh. Yeah. All and be blessed. Sorry, guys. This wide and universal theater presents more woeful pageants than the scene we're in we play in. All the world is a stage. And all the men and women merely players. 
It's a hard speech to do, right? Because other, there are other, Kevin Klein does it in the Kenneth Branagh movie. It's amazing, I just couldn't find it. Do you like the Jacques? You like, is he a good character? Let's, let's see, let's look. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts, his act being seven ages. At first, the infant, Muley. One man plays many parts. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like different stages. stages. So it's obviously a, meta, a dramatic metaphor inside this play, which is also all about drama. Mm -hmm. And we have to see what, what Jacques' inflection of this drama is. If life is a drama, according to Jacques, what kind of drama is it? Then puking in the nurse's arms. And then... So how many ages of men are there? Seven. 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 Should we count them? Yeah, let's count them. One is puking. One is puking. The whining schoolboy. <laughs> That's hilarious, That's right? <laughs> Isn't that adorable? Yeah. And it's not only adorable. Is this a free like show? No, um, mm -hmm. uh, maybe for these school kids, it is. I mean, it's not only adorable, but it's it's also what Shakespeare would have depended upon is breaking down the relationship between. Yeah. They keep breaking play the fourth wall. and exactly. an audience. They keep breaking the fourth wall. Yeah, exactly. Because, well, think why they're doing that, right? Just as there's no there's difference water. between the out the outside audience and what's happening on the play, in some sense, there's a relationship between art and life. It's like yeah, it's like the point. And the truest poetry is the most feigning, because it's it's right. Yeah. I mean, it, and we'll see at the end of the play when Rosalind gives her speech, she totally manipulates that. Um, but this is just terrific. <laughs> With his satchel and shining morning face. <laughs> that kid is very embarrassed, right? <laughs> Creeping like snail unwillingly to school. Oh, is, that, is that what number are we at? Two. That was two? two. That was a schoolboy? Yeah. I mean, that is written by someone who has, has a son. And then the lover, sighing like furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress eyebrow. He could be talking about... Orlando, right? Then a soldier. Well, wait, oh, that was the lover didn't get the lover. the lover didn't get very much. So we have so far puking, schoolboy, lover, lover, lover. lover. Four. and now we got this is soldier. We're at four. Yeah. In Joe's and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. Seeking the bubble reputation. What do soldiers do? They Actions. seek your, they yeah. seek reputation and glory. <laughs> Then the justice, the fair round belly, with good cape and line, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances. And so he plays his part. This one. Is, is, is this kind of, that sadness injected into his voice, is that justified by the speech? Yeah, because it's a very bleak. Why is it bleak? Isn't he describing the stages accurately? What's 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 so bleak about it? That it's a point of view. It's so mundane, and it's it's the cycle that never ends. And this is the way. This is the only progression that. Can Every everybody has their role, and they fill it, day after day, after day. Very bleak. Tomorrow and tomorrow mm -hmm. and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Macbeth, right? Oh, yeah. Could be. Could be. Yeah. That, that um, we're not going to be reading that. We're not going to be reading that bit right now. Um, <laughs> I think it it like makes this one a lot more thought provoking. In, in what in, in what sense? In that in that you get to see the like the you know Jacques is almost like a, a Jacques yeah Jacques you're saying I can't pronounce okay um, is almost like a, a, a tragical figure right mm -hmm. he's very cynical um, but in this in this um, when you compare this speech with the one in Macbeth yeah um, you, it, it it's a lot less tragic because he he is shown the wealth of life whereas Macbeth is just talking okay. about so uh, very, you know, okay. we're all going to die. Good. Okay. So no, different, it, well, different genres. But let's focus on this. Thank you. So, but there, I mean, it, that's interesting. I mean, but there is this sense of self-consciousness of I'm doing the same thing every day, day after day after day after day, and you have a certain role and you fill it, and after you fill that role, what happens? You do it all over again. You die. You right. Die. Right. Well, well, right. Well, it, it depends on your worldview, I guess. Life. Right. <laughs> um, let, let's it's just. One keep, of the darkest, and I think. It's a very, it's, it, it really, it is, a, it's so funny because everybody proclaims all the world's a stage, right? Um, and, the it, when, it's, when it's out of context, 
And in context, it's pretty depressing. This idea that every part of your life is predetermined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You wake up in the, I mean, you, as just as Shakespeare says, There's you no go to college, you get a job, you know, we could do the, could we do the seven ages of a man for the 21st century world? Mm. Probably, oh, we probably could, yeah. probably could. And have this sense of, there are people who are defined by their routines. Yeah. And, and Jacques is saying, everybody is. It's pretty depressing. Even right. yeah. Sick day, chips into lean and slippered pantaloon. What is, it, what is, it, what is a lean and slippered pantaloon? Socks, trousers. Socks, trousers, right? We're imagining yeah. this old guy in, 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 in uh, uh, sweatpants, which are much too big for him, right? Tickles on nose and pouch on sides. His youthful hose well saved a world too wide for his shrunk shanks. And his big manly voice turning again towards childish treble pipes and whistles in his sound. Last sea of all that ends this same eventful history. His second childishness and mere oblivion. Son's teeth, son's eyes, son's taste. What is this doing in a comedy? It's so weird, right? This is the sombering effect. Like, it's just that, that counterbalance. Yeah. We were talking about this map before. So on the one hand, you have um, Orlando, mm -hmm. this romantic ideal. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have Jacques this total depressing skeptic. So the question is, do, does Jacques have a place in Rosalind's worldview? Does Orlando have a place in Rosalind's worldview? Yeah, they both do. She's uh, okay, good, right. She's and, it's, yeah. in, a, in a way, everyone, she... Yeah, everyone is not, she's the only complex character. Everyone, well, she's, so she, we'll, we have to see this out a little bit more. Right. But yeah. she is, in some sense, accommodating the skepticism of Jacques but also having the passion of Orlando. Mm -hmm. You see though, it's like such a, a, we have to see how Shakespeare builds this, but it's such a beautiful solution really, that, the, that we have a kind of mapping of different kinds of love, the melancholic refusal of love, skepticism about love, the, the Petrarchian idealization of love, and then there is that mediating term, the figure of Rosalind. We'll have to see that if that in fact is the case. That she actually, that she, this is kind of a coming attraction. Does she actually incorporate that skepticism and maintain that passion and enthusiasm? So Shakespeare's actually with this figure, this character, creating a certain way of seeing or being in the world with both idealism and skepticism. Now, I, the, the truth is, I have to apologize because we're really not up to this yet. We need to see more of the play and read more of it. But I'm just, I, you can see my enthusiasm for the figure of, of Rosalind. And part of it is because Shakespeare creates her in this way, which creates this very complex view of life. I'm, I mean, seriously, is it, is it easy for us to be both enthusiastic and skeptics at the same time? Mm-hmm. Well, you think of like enthusiasts today, or like you could, there are many different kinds of enthusiasts, but some of them you could imagine are fundamentalists, right? They have no self consciousness about what they're doing. They have absolutely no self consciousness. On the other hand, there are who are the Jacques of the world? We have enough of them all over the world, right? They're a kind of skepticism. Or the ideal uh, that Orlando can just be the ideal of love. I'm, head, I'm totally head over heels in love. Which is, as we were saying before, is like a caricature of love. It's, it's a narcissistic version of love. Is there a kind of love that's really possible that is not going to be the silly, sickening love of Orlando? Yeah, that's why they so talk I, So I'm just saying to see the play in this way as a kind of a map mm -hmm. where Rosalind maybe will mediate between them. Um, yeah, let, let's, yeah, take, but you, every time you say, I, your questions are always confusing me. But I hope this is an easy this one. This is not a question. Okay, that's um, a comment. I, I wanted to, to say that perhaps yeah. um, Jacques is, is a humorous element because of how out of place he is, kind of how people like um, 
Okay, I mean, we have, well, 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 we, well, 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 we have we have touched on for that, but but okay, okay. So we're we gonna. So what is the last part of his speech? Um, sons. Yes, sons. Sons all. Sons, 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 sons everything, mm -hmm. which means that you are nothing at the end. Right. You fulfill these steps, right. these seven steps, and then you accumulate to nothing. So and there, there again, we can talk about the way which in which the, the Shakespeare is accommodating this very skimpy perspective. Like it's like, it's like, what is this? What, where, why again is this in comedy? It's like that Poussin painting, but instead of having the 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 dead body and, and the little tiny in the foreground, it's like taking over the whole painting, right? He's giving a, a tremendous amount of. Um, giving a lot of lines, as we said, to Jacques and his sensibility. <laughs> I told you before, this is, this, is not, this is the scene before the scene I would want to watch. I mentioned this to you before earlier, that here Oliver is being punished by the Duke. Why? He doesn't know where... Where his brother is. Oh, right. He wants to know where his brother is, right. Oh, no, don't do that. I find that speech by... Um... Make an extent... Yeah. No, I was just saying the speech by ja Jacques is so fascinating because just in my one of my earlier classes mm -hmm. today we were talking about how plot is is constructed by all ideological like things that we as society feel mm -hmm. and it's like during this time I didn't think that people were thinking about their everyday which is like sort of maybe a juvenile idea but that they weren't thinking about their everyday life and how. They're just passing the time and doing everything. It's not juvenile at all. We have a tendency to do that but about the past. Well, we have a ten we, we have a tendency to simplify the worldviews of the past. You think this? I mean, I think Jacques is expressing a very, very modern perception. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is it's fascinating to see that in this play? Right. <laughs> right. So, but I'm saying we we because people, we start out not knowing the language, we think that they can actually express things that we can. But you know what? It turns out they can actually express more. Yeah. Which is what's crazy is that Shakespeare. It really is. Shakespeare gives the whole reign of the human experience. That cliche is somehow unbelievably true. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Shakespeare really is our contemporary. Shakespeare should be our contemporary. Shakespeare gives us the words to, we need to describe some of the worlds inside of us, internal to us. That's why literature is so important. upon his house and lands. <laughs> and here again, he's a bloody mess, right? But here the production is emphasizing this This is getting very close to being a really depressing play. Right? Make him as bloody as possible. <laughs> Do this expediently! <laughs> again, this is not part of Shakespeare's stage directions. This is the production, right? I turn him going home! Then, my verse... <laughs> what a what a juxtaposition, right? Orlando and his brother. So Orlando, where is he? In Lala. Oh, he's in Fantasyland, right? My love. And thou, thrice crowned queen of night, survey with thy chaste eyes. From the There's the bad poetry, right? He's just started, and people would know this is bad poetry, right? Even we can sense it. It's over the top. I pale sphere above. Thy men. <laughs> it's like, what is he doing? What is he talking about? It's like he read, and he probably did, a la Hobie and Castiglione, he probably read a poetry manual. This is how you write a sonnet, poetry right? For poetry for dummies, right? <laughs> exactly. He read, he read the back part. He read the part. <laughs> oh, not an end! These trees shall be my books. And in their barks, my thoughts are character. But every eye which in this forest looks shall see thy virtue witness everywhere. Again, it's adorable, but if somebody did that to you, you'd run. You'd call the police, yeah. right? Get a restraining order. <laughs> Get a restraining order on Orlando. <laughs> run, Orlando, carve on every tree. Oh, there's the fair, the chaste and unexpressive. Where's this all coming from? Where's the paper from? How like you? See here, what we have Jacques in the classroom. Don't you believe in love and first sight? Come on. <laughs> this shepherd's life, master touched. Oh, uh, there's there. Truly, a shepherd, in respect of itself, it is a good life. But in respect that it is a shepherd's life, it is naught. In respect that that's it is solitary. That's touchstone. He's what? what? He's he has reformed 
himself. He is he a new person. He doesn't have his hat. <laughs> yeah. Well, Touchstone, we'll, we'll get, we're getting to know Touchstone, so he's feeling more comfortable with us, okay? Um, Why are you jumping up? Here's Touchstone's confrontation with Corrin, Corrin yes. being the simplistic country bumpkin, and Touchstone being the guy who sees things from more than one perspective. If, uh, listen, let's listen carefully. Master Touchstone. Truly, shepherd, in respect of itself, it is a good life, but in respect that it is a shepherd's life, it is not. How is that possible? That is, and what's the line again? In the respect? Oh, they think the shepherd's, uh, life. A shepherd's life, life is a good life. And the shepherd is... It, it's a good life, but you being a shepherd just means that it's uh, not. No, like, I mean, you can I mean, have a good life being a I mean, shepherd, I, I just need to, I need to know that, yeah. <clears throat> means that it's not. We have to, I want to pay precise attention to, to the language, yeah. which I, I can't see Wait, in the door. I'll get it, I'll get it. So let's do our favorite site for Pat Shakespeare, as you like it, MIT. Okay, entire play. What, now give me, what word should we? Well, we're just going to do a, search, a word search, right? Line, it's, it's line 12. Line 3, scene 1, line 12. Uh, that's, does, yeah. There we go. Here it is. Uh, and how like you this mas this shepherd's life, Master Touchstone? So we're going to read it first, and then we'll let that we'll let it be played. Um, truly, shepherd, in respect of itself, it is a good life. Yeah. But in respect that it is a shepherd's life, it is not. How does that make sense? Like you can have a good life being a shepherd, but the fact that you are a shepherd means that you have a bad life. <laughs> I, I, I think I'm kind of following that. Just look, I, I mean, in 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 and of itself, from its own perspective, it's fine. Yeah. But the fact that it is a shepherd's life, that is from my perspective of the court, it's, right. it's not fine, right? In respect that it is solitary, I like it very well. But in respect that it is private and not public, when we think of private, we think of public as his opposition. It, um, it is a very vile life. Touchstone will keep on bringing in the comparative terms. And now in respect that it is in the fields, it pleases we well, but in respect that it is not in the court, it is tedious, right? You see the same thing over and over again. We were talking about Touchstone sensibility earlier in the play. It's this double sensibility. Um, okay, let's see, let's see, uh, let's give Touchstone a chance to act. <laughs> In respect that it is solitary, I like it very well. In respect that it is private, it is a very vile life. Now, in respect that it is... It's so much different after you read it and then you yeah. see it. You're like, oh my God. When you read it, you right? understand what they're going to say. Oh my God, in order to understand the play way, you have to <laughs> read it. Oh my God. <laughs> in the field, it pleases me well. But in respect that it is not in the court, it is a uh, tedious! <laughs> as it is a square life, look, it fits my humour well, but as there is no more plenty in it, it is much against my humour. <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're the director, you're going to let this guy ham it up like that? <laughs> Has any philosophy in me? <laughs> He's funny though, right? Yeah. I know the more one. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, we'll, we'll see even more it's of him. It's good casting. It's good casting. Um, yeah, so let's skip ahead now to, I'll, you'll tell me in a second, because it's dark and I can only go by the numbers I wrote down. Let's see where we are. Oh, this is good. My bag of verses. So, so they've, they're, we're, where are we right now? In we're obviously Arden. in the forest of Arden, and Celia and Rosalind are marveling at this phenomenon of poetry on, on trees, on trees. Wow, and, really and they're checking out the, is this is, is this good poetry or not? Didst thou hear without wondering how thy name should be hand and carved upon these trees? Know you who have done this? We, we skip the part where they read the bad poetry in a highly affected manner. Like now, the, now the question is, Ro it? Rosalind's like, who wrote it? This is kind of fantastic, really. I mean, who could have written it? Is it back? <laughs> <Right. laughs> <laughs> and a chain that you once wore? It's like, Duke, it's like a hint. Remember at the end of the wrestling match? Yeah. He, she bestows she his necklace. Neck, her necklace to him. At his neck? Change you color? No? Who? Oh, Lord, Lord. <laughs> like, it is a hard matter for friends to meet, but mountains may be removed with earthquakes and so encounter. No! 
Which who is it? Is it <laughs> possible? I pretty now with most petitionary vehemence. Tell me who it is. Oh, wonderful, 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 wonderful. And then again, wonderful. And after that, wonderful. But my complexion. The sun thinks that I am comparison like a man. I have a doublet and hose in my disposition. What if it should delay more? She says, just because I look like a man doesn't mean I have a doublet and hose, a man's dress, in my disposition. I won't go through the different roles that she's playing in this play, right? In which she's really both at the same time. It's a South Sea of discovery. I'm ready to tell you who is it. Quickly, let's pick a pace. I must have to stab her. I might pull this concealed man out of thy mouth as wine comes out of thy mouth. It's a little sexual pun there, right? <laughs> 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 man, so his head worth a hat or his chin worth a beard? Nay, hey, he had but a little beard. Why, God will send more if the man will be thankful. Let <laughs> me state the growth of his beard as thou delay me not the knowledge of his chin. It is young Orlando. Nay, but the devil take mocking, speak sad brow and true maid. In faith, cuz, it is he. Orlando. Orlando! <laughs> 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 Miss the day, what shall I do with my dog to hose? What did he, when I saw his team? What said he? How looked he? Where he went? Where he he? How far did he? And when shall I see him again? Answer me in one word. <laughs> <laughs> you must borrow me Gargantua's mouth first. Is the word too great for any mouth of this age's size? To say I am no to these particulars is more than to answer in a catechism. Oh, what does he know that I am in this forest and in man's apparel? Look, see as freshly as he did the day he wrestled. It is as easy to count atomies as to resolve the propositions of a lover, but take a taste of my finding him and relish it with good observance. I found him under a tree oh, like a drop. Acorn. They may well be called Jove's tree when it drops forth such fruit. She's also doing the bad poetry thing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Give me audience, good madam. No kidding. There lay he, stretched along like a wounded knight. It's funny, in this relationship, she's Celia's the skeptic and yeah. and and Rosalind, and Rosalind is, is, the, is the idealist. So maybe she also needs Orlando? Oh, mm. Be pitied to see such a sight, it well becomes the ground. Cry holler to thy tongue, my pretty, if curvets unseasonably. <laughs> he was furnished like a hunter. Oh, oh, he comes to kill my heart. I would sing my song without a burden, that brings me out of tune. No, no I am a woman. When I sing, how to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> Ladies, I'm just kidding. Um, is, is that true? I'm a woman when I speak, when I think I'm a speak? It's interesting that at this part of the play, she says that. Will that be true at the end of the play? At, at the end of the play, here she's, here she's evidencing all of the idealism of love which we're associating with Orlando. By the end of the play, and we'll have to see if the reading that I've suggested plays out, the skepticism of Jacques gets integrated into her perspective on love. But here, at least, at the beginning, we just see she's the idealist and Celia is the skeptic, which is also kind of cool, right? That she becomes her best, she becomes, she takes in the characteristic of her best friend. Mm -hmm. Sweet, say off. You bring me out. But stop, comes he not here? Let's, let's just skip a little bit, a little bit. That's a great scene, right? I feel, I feel like the whole like, men who don't talk to women thing is out the window. Men who don't talk to women, we're making generalizations now about all men. <laughs> no, about men who don't talk to women. Men, men who don't, no, men who don't talk to women. I think that women talk incessantly. After there's research where I'm, well, You know, wait, 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 we're not gonna do research on that. Um, um, Medea is all, I just taught Medea to the first year class, which is really all about that, right? Um, about what men think about women, right? Um, here we are, you'll have to tell me where we are as soon as 
we there's the scene open because again I just have my time numbers that are visible. Oh, uh, there's so so we already said that. Or um, oh, let's let's go back to this. I am no longer with you. I am glad of your departure. Adieu, good Monsieur. Mm -hmm. Oh, let's actually see. Let's see more of their their interchange. Okay, good. So it's nice the way, look how, look how the director positions them at the beginning, right? Some directors are smart, right? If you have smart directors, you have a good play. If you have a dumb director, you have a very uninteresting play. And most Shakespearean directors are not really, there are very few Shakespearean, really good Shakespearean directors, right? Because you have to know something. Strange, right? Oh, no more trees with writing love songs in their butts. I pray you, ma no more of my verses with reading them ill favoredly. <coughs> Rosalind is your love. He's, uh, ja uh, or, uh, uh, Jacques says to Orlando, stop writing bad poetry. Like, and, 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 and Orlando says, don't be so skeptical, be more generous, right? Yes, I do not like her name. <laughs> was no thought of pleasing you when she was christened. <laughs> what stature is she of? Just as high as my heart. Oh my god, right? Uh, it's pouring it on, right? I don't know, is it an awe moment or oh my god? I think it's more of an oh my god moment. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's two worlds colliding. He's laughing at himself also. Yeah. It looks like it. That's, so that's making him a little self-conscious, which I'm not sure is justified. Oh, you are full of pretty answers. Not so. I answer you. Right. You have a nimble wit. Will you sit down with me and we two will rail against our mistress of the world and all our misery. I will try. What does he want to do? You want to hang out with me? And like... We'll, we'll just complain. We'll complain about how bad the world is. Do you want to hear me complain for the next three hours? Let's do it together. A breather in the world, but myself, against whom I know most faults. The worst fault you have is to be in love. It is a fault I will not change for your best virtue. I am weary of you. By my troth, I was seeking for a fool when I found you. Oh. Right. Why is he so disappointed? Who? I, I was, Jacques said, I was looking for a fool. And later on, or earlier, he says, a fool, a fool. Yeah. I made a fool in the forest. Why does he like the fool better? What compared to, to Orlando? The fool, the, the, the fool is like sees things in a complicated manner, right? Mm -hmm. And he's stuck with this guy, who's just this crazy idealist, right? I wanted a fool. I wanted to think a little bit. I didn't want to delve into your, you know, psychic, you know, uh, sandbox romance. or romance, right? Um, right. He's drowned in the brook. Look but in, and you shall see him. There, I shall see my own figure. Which I take to be either a fool or a cipher. I'll tarry no longer with you. I am glad of your departure. Adieu, good Monsieur Melancholy. Farewell, good Signor Love. I mean, Shakespeare couldn't be making it any more clear, right? He's using, like, these allegorical names. Signor Melancholy and... Signor Love and Monsieur Melancholy. It's like he's giving them names from like the Marlovian world, right? Here's melancholy, and here's love. Right. I mean, right? So it's not, when I said to map the play, it's like he's really doing it for us, especially at this production. Um, okay, let's skip ahead a little bit more. Let's go back here, let's see where we are now. Thanks. Has the Coney, you see, dwell where she is kin. Your accent is something finer than you could purchase in so removed a dwelling. I have been told so of many. So she says, he says to her, you're not from these parts, right? He's you're so dumb. You're not from around here, are you? Why does he know she, she's, why does he know? She sounds culture, upper class. Uh, yeah, she's, the, the, we see the kinds of people you meet in, in, in the Forest of Art. Right? Yeah, either shepherds or they're... Right, country bumpkins, yeah. right. She, she doesn't sound like a native to this place. She sounds like she lives on the Upper West Side and not in, you know, some um, ungentrified tenement in Brooklyn, right? Um, right. But indeed, 
an old religious uncle of mine taught me to speak, who was, in his youth, an inland man, one who knew courtship too well, for there he fell in love. I have heard him read many lectures against it, and I thank God I'm not a woman. I blame you, I'm really big here. Right. What is she doing? What is, what is she doing with him? She's trying to convince him that she's not gross. I am a man. Yeah. But, yeah, but no, that's that's yeah. the the, the given the given is guys. The given is he does not recognize her. Okay, which that, is ridiculous. Uh, but okay, no, it's not. but that's that's the given is that they don't recognize each other. So what? Given that, I mean, she's not just trying to prove that she's a man. What is what is this game that she's about to outline? She's trying to. So he sees, she sees this guy in the forest who's madly in love and basically says, there's something wrong with you, right? And then she says, fortunately, there is something wrong with you, but I can cure you. And she's about to set up this game. And this is the additional gender change, right? What's the gender change now? She pretend to be a woman now. So now she will pretend. There you go. She's, pretend, she's pretending to be a woman. She's pretending to be herself. Yeah. Ma wh yeah. ma whatever that's a, we have to we have to refine that in some sense yes um, so there we're setting up that game again why is she um, she doing this why is she doing this you didn't answer that question hmm? why is she doing this to him I think she's manipulating she to see the true his true self yeah like she's trying to manipulate the situation so that she can test him to see if he really if he really loves her, her. Yeah. if his virtues if he's true does this remind you? Here, this is a question. Is it just me? Does this remind you of any scene that you've seen in great Western literature? I feel like the scene happens all the time. I'm, I'm telling you, the, arc, the, arc, you, you, the archetypal scene. Of pretending to. This is, this is something that happens all the time. Of, of, of a man or a woman, of a couple testing each other to see if they're like the There you go, right? I'm telling you, this is, as you'll see, this. Think, just have their discussion in mind mm -hmm. as you watch this. <clears throat> so many giddy offenses as if generally taxed their whole sex with all... Can you remember any of the principal evils that he made to the charge of women? There were no principal. They were all like for the mother's hair to himself. Every one felt seeming monstrous to his fellow... See, every woman is seeming monstrous. That She's is, giving us a really bad rap. <laughs> uh, so well, how is this part of her play? She's trying to get him uh, off of a woman, and if he will go past her, wait, no, never mind. She wants yeah. to respond. No, I'm just, I'm I think I'm just trying to follow you. I think she, she wants, wants to disagree. Yeah. She's being inflammatory, and she, she wants to respond. She wants she's to find out what if he tells her what she what what he what what he really feels. I mean, she's after she's all, we after all the she, he's she's confident. fishing. Yeah, after she's all, fishing. do you want to marry? What happens if you marry an idealist guy like this guy? Do not marry a guy like this guy. But why? What happens after two years? He finds somebody else. No, out. he can't deal with reality, or his reality is the total opposite of what he pretended to be. So she's shaping him into. Uh, we'll have to see. I think that's a good metaphor. We'll see that that's part of that. I mean, you're right. Been bringing up the Odyssey. Penelope is really testing him if he's still loyal. Yeah. Loyal. In some sense, here Rosalind. There, Rosalind is like more of this. She's actually changing him. She's shaping him. And Hamlet, Hamlet like Rosalind, they are, they are directors of plays. And Hamlet, there is the famous play within the play. Right. Mm -hmm. This is the play within the play, right. and as you like it. And who's the director? Awesome. Rosalind. Rosalind. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't just think of a Shakespeare, a, any character who you could like more than Rosalind, right? <laughs> any, oh, yeah, I mean, tragic <laughs> figures, right? Oh, no. I will not cast away my physic, but on those that are sick, there is a man who haunts the forest. So she says, I'm only going to take care, I, I, I'm, I would tell you my secrets, but I, I don't tell them for nothing. Is there anybody sick? And then she just mentions, she happens to mention, oh, well, there is actually a man in the forest. What's he doing? Hanging up sonnets. We count some of them. No, I will not cast away my physic, but on those that are sick. There is a man who haunts the forest that abuses our young plants by carving Rosalind in their bark. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, to the who's that? It pillages upon brambles, or forsooth deifying the name Rosalind. 
If I could make that fancy manga, I would give him some good counsel, but he seems to have the continued love upon him. I am! I pray you, tell me your remedy. He's in a I mean, what, what, does she, what does she say about this? What does she say about this guy? What is, what is, what is her image of, of the guy? Well, he's the good guy. He's, he's the one that's writing poetry. She's the one suffering advice. He is the like good guy. He's the, he, he, well, but now she's skeptical, actually, because she's read Petrarch, and she's read all of the Renaissance uh, sonnets that we've read, and we're, we know about the ideal lover, and Rosalind is going to say, wait a second, you don't actually, you don't actually fit the bill. Marks upon you. He taught me how to know a man in love. What were his marks? A lean cheek, which you have not. A good. <laughs> <laughs> what all the things? All the things. Why, why should he have a lean cheek? He because he's he he's he hasn't eat, eaten or drunk or uh, because he's so madly in love. Do I am sunken, which you have not. An unquestionable spirit, which you have not. A beard neglected, which you oh, have yeah. not. Then your hose should be unguarded, your bonnet unguarded, your sleeve unbuttoned, your shoe untied, and everything about him demonstrating a... He, he's too well dressed to be a, a real lover, right? I love seeing you. Oh, this desolation. But you are no such man. You are rather point device in your own... Yeah, well, what, do not like what, is, what, is, what does point device mean? <laughs> he, looks, he, he looked too good, right? You spent too much time in front of the mirror She's this like morning. She's giving him a compliment, but like... Back mean, nah, she just said you can't really... Well, yeah. You're too into yourself, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I, well, I don't know. Whatever message, I mean, we have to just see this whole interchange between the two of them, how she's relating to him. As loving yourself than seeming the lover of any other. Thanks. As loving yourself than seeming the lover of any other. Orlando is beware of Orlando, right? He's the he's the guy with the nice profile on the dating site, right? Mm -hmm. This is the one you have to be really suspicious of. You yes, I mean, I can make me believe I love. Can you believe it? You may see my cousin. <laughs> right, me believe it, right? How resonant that is. Me believe it. She's saying it both as Ganymede and, and as Rosalind. Rosalind. But you love me, which I warrant. She is apter to do than to confess she does. That is one of the points in which women still give the lie to their consciences. But... Can we go read Can we do that again? That was too fast for me. Sleeve unbuttoned, your shoe untied, and everything about him demonstrating a careless desolation. But you are no such man. You are rather point device in your accoutrements, as loving yourself than seeing the lover of any other. Thank you, sir. But I can make me believe I love. Me believe it. You may soon make her that you love believe it, which I warrant. She is apter to do than to confess she does. That is one of the points in which women still give the lie to their consciences. But in good sooth, are you he that hangs the verses on the trees wherein Rosalind is so admired? I swear to thee, youth, by the white hand of Rosalind, I am that he, that unfortunate. <laughs> Are you I'm totally reveling in this mm -hmm. foolish perspective. I mean, not foolish, but... She's like, I really don't, didn't want you to think that he's also a little But in love, as your rhyme speak, neither rhyme nor reason can express how much. <laughs> She's good here, right? She pauses just enough to take a good look at it and also express that there's part of it that she really likes, mm -hmm. right? Again, for her. Love is merely a madness. Ah, but that, then, she re, then she reverts to safeness, right? Mm -hmm. Love is merely a madness. I'm not going there, says Rosalind, right? And I tell you, deserves as well a dark house and a whip as madmen do. And the reason why they are not so punished and cured is that the lunacy is so ordinary that the whippers are in love too. Oh, we have to look at that. I think that's one of, one of Shakespeare's great lines. That's a silly thing to say, but I really like this one. So Rosalind says here. That the lunacy is so ornate. Wait, 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 love is merely a madness. And I tell you, deserves as well a dark house and a whip as madmen do. Lovers should be punished just like madmen. And the reason why they are not so punished and cured is that the lunacy is so ordinary that the whippers are in love too. That's 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? It just, and that really makes up the sensibility of this play. This play that just suffused with love. I mean, there are a lot of other things. Just to throw, I mean, we didn't even notice it, right? That's why you have to read the plays, right? Because if you see it, you can't, you can't keep up with it. It's fast. It's not only fast. You're, even if you could keep up with it, because it was slow, you couldn't keep up with it. It's, because you have to understand it. It's, it's one of the paradoxes of, of learning, is in order to understand, you have to already understand. Mm. That is a paradox, but it's true. But I confess curing it by counsel. Do you ever cure any? Sorry. Yes, one. And in this manner, he was to imagine me his love, his mistress, and I set him every day to woo me, at which time would I, being but a moonish youth, Greed, the effeminate, changeable, long and liking, proud, fantastical, apish, shallow, inconstant, full of tears, full of smiles, would now like him, now loathe him, then entertain him, then forswear him, now weep for him, then spit at him. But I drove my suitor from his mad humour of love into a living humour of madness, which was to forswear the full stream of the world, and to live in a nook merely monastic. And thus, I cured him. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what, like, how did she cure him? What did like she do? Driving him mad, insane. Right. So all of the all of the nasty stereotypes about women just came out. She just said them all. You said it's better to be insane than being Great. Let's just pick up the end of that. Being but a moonish youth, greed, the effeminate, changeable, long and liking. Proud, fantastical, apish, shallow, inconstant. Are you sure you want to get married to her? Right? <laughs> full of tears, full of smiles. But now like him, now loathe him. Then entertain him, then forswear him. Now weep for him, then spit at him. But I drove my suitor from his mad humour of love into a living humour of madness, which was to forswear the full stream of the world and to live in a nook merely monastic. And thus, <coughs> I cured him. And this way will I take upon me to wash your liver as clean as a sound sheep's heart, that there shall not be one spot of love in it. I would not be cured, youth. I would cure you if you would but call me Rosalind. Oh my God. Whoa, plot twist. <laughs> this, this is what I said. This is the play within the play. It does hurt your head, yeah. It should hurt your head, right? So this is the coolest part, Imagine though, right? Why did? Why would he want this? He's a, he's happy to be in love. Why does he want to be? Why does he want to be? Uh, you know, a, a, a cured of love. He says madness. He gets to spend time with her. Oh, but she. Th- wait a second, but you can't. Do, Deborah, you can't do that all so quickly because. They don't, he doesn't doesn't know know that it's her, or does he, right? This is where we're talking about the magic. And here, we're seeing it right now, right? This this transformative magic of love. Every day to my coat. So, right. I mean, and, and Shakespeare is not only playing with the idea of homoerotic relationships with Celia and Rosalind, but also with Orlando and Ganymede, right? Ganymede, who really, who Ganymede is, the, is the male Rosalind is pretending to be, right? And who me? The music is Now by the face of my love, I will. Go if you took, and I'll show it you. And by the way, you should tell me where in the forest you live. Will you go? With all my heart, could you? Nay, you must call me Rosalind. (laughs) (laughs) Why is that so important? That's the play, right? Yeah. Uh, Give a person a mask, and they can tell you who you are. You give a person a mask and you or, and let him tell the truth about himself. So Rosalind is now playing herself. Guest star as Rosalind. Rosalind. 
Mission. Okay, we can stop them. That, that's that's not even. I mean, it's not even the best part. Right. So, right. Um, so we have one more class, and, th and next time, please rem write down what we, we how what we discussed today. So next time, when I ask you what we talked yeah, about, yeah. you somebody will know because we got off to a very slow start, which was entirely my fault. Um, um, okay, so uh, I'll see you next time. Oh, oh, right. What? Yeah, I can turn this off now. Um.